as he sings, that, as Dennis sung that song, This Is My Story, this church has a, has a huge part of my story. Uh, and as I pick up uh, hymnals with names like Roy Wills in it, and then uh, the Bible with Mr. Tommy Nixon's name in it, it brings back a lot of memories and people that, that men that I looked up to and watched them interact and, and watched them live out their faith, kind of a lot of things come back to me. And some of the, I can tell you this, my time at Union Hill, one of the only things that I regret about being at Union Hill was being late to Cleet Underwood Sunday School class. He took, he took our class, and I've cited that more times than, than he could probably knows, but I was listening. When I, when I did get there, I was listening. I'm used to late I know it, and, it, and, it, and it, it, it aggravates me because I want to tell you this. When you sit down in a Sunday school class or you come to a service, there, it's not a small effort to prepare for anything like that. And the effort that Cleet put into his Sunday school lessons and uh, vacation Bible school teachers I had here and the preachers that were here, uh, now in hindsight, I see how much effort it took and how much dedication that it took to stay in God's Word and study. I mean, Cleet challenged us to fast one time and we studied fasting for like a month and he was the only one that did it. I felt bad about that. But now he learned a lot from that. Now since then, I have done that. But now to begin with, before we get started, I'm going I'm to preface this sermon with something. This message is pretty much for the church. Not, this isn't a Union Hill Covenant Presbyterian message. This, this isn't a First Baptist message. This is to the church at large. This is to the church that is here, the hands and feet of Jesus, practicing their faith every day or not. If you profess to be a Christian, say amen. amen. Then this is to you. Now, if you're not a Christian, I'm going to preface this sermon with this one thing about Jesus. He told his disciples first not to go get educated, not to do the, say the right kind of prayer. He, told, he instructed every person to follow him with simply, follow me. If you don't know about Jesus, follow Jesus. Pick a gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, pick one. And read about Jesus. And pray. And you will find opportunities to practice the things that Jesus taught. And through that, you will come with a greater spiritual understanding than any PhD that you could acquire from any school. By simply following Jesus. Over the last little bit, over the course of this year, I'm going to cover 10 months of preaching quick. Think I can do it? No. I can, I'm pretty quick. I'll tell you this, I finished James way faster than Dennis has. <laughs> no, we did. We did. At, at church, we started out in the book of James. And the reason we started out in the book of James and went all the way through it. I can tell you this. As Dennis goes through the book of James, it would do everybody in here well just to read the book of James once a week. Just to read the whole thing in its entirety and admire the, the structure of it. Admire all that went into that, those five chapters. And admire the fact that it is literally Christian maturity on the fast track. You want to learn how to be a mature Christian quick? Read James a lot because he tells the do's and don'ts without fluff. It's a great book. But from there, this Christian maturity thought process led me through a study of into the Sermon on the Mount in the discourses of Jesus. And through the Sermon on the Mount, the very first Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, we learned the practical application of the law, of the Jewish law. And Jesus said that he had come to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, but to fulfill it. And on the way through that, you get an understanding of how Jesus was educating his disciples. Not the crowds of people that were following him, waiting for miracles and all this other stuff. The people that were really invested, the people that really wanted to learn. I like being here tonight because you've made plans to be here. When you preach on a Sunday morning, that's fine. It could be a thick protein shake, you know, at a lot of churches. But you get meat on Sunday night, Wednesday night, and at revivals. Because every one of you made adjustments in your schedule somehow to be here. Even if you didn't have anything to do, you could have done other stuff. 
but you chose to be here on a Tuesday night. I'm tickled that you are. Because as, as we went through the uh, first discourse of Matthew, leading into the second discourse, is where we're going to pick up. But if you will, turn in your Bibles. If you got your Bible, we, if you don't, don't worry about them. We'll read it to you anyway. But in Matthew chapter 9 is where we'll begin. Because as Jesus begins this, this second discourse, a lot comes into play from his first discourse. And we're not going to cover all of it. We're going to come in three chunks of it. Because the very first thing you might notice in the end of Matthew chapter 9 is how Jesus prayed for laborers. He said, y'all, the harvest is plenteous, he says in the King James, but the laborers are few. And if you have ever tried to get help hauling hay, you know how few the laborers are. <laughs> but they ain't no bigger blessing than an empty hay field and a full barn. We've said a lot of times over here in this pasture over at Uncle Stan's and looked at thousands of bales and just wondered how we were going to get them all up. And then some unsuspecting soul would drive by and we would sucker him into helping us and, you know, however we got it done. But laborers were in short supply. So Jesus tells his disciples at the end of chapter 9, he says, Look, y'all, y'all pray to the Lord of the harvest that he will send laborers into the harvest. And the disciples are like everybody else in churches that say, when they say pray for missionaries, they're like, Yes, we can pray for missionaries. Woohoo! And if you look in other places, in, uh, in I believe the Gospel of Luke, you'll see where Jesus prayed all night in this section, if you read it chronologically. But what you'll find is when he came back from praying, he told the disciples what we find in the beginning of the second discourse in chapter 10, that he gave them authority. He gave them authority or power to cast out demons, to heal sick people, all this stuff. And the disciples are like, yes, we prayed for laborers. You're going to give us power. And Jesus said, then go to... Whoa, go. I don't know about this go word. So I'm sure the disciples were a little shocked at the whole go premise. But Jesus said, go to the lost sheep. Not to, the, not to people at large, but go to the lost sheep. And what he did in this point, here's where a lot of people draw the line. Because when you read scripture, you have to look at who the author is speaking to, the occasion that they're speaking, and why this is being said. In this particular instance, in the second discourse, this is a teaching to the disciples, which Jesus made apostles. So how can we apply it? We can learn something from every word in scripture. We can learn something for every application. Be careful of getting tattoos of Bible verses without getting the context of the Bible verse. You know, a lot of people have those tattoo verses. Philippians is full of that. <coughs> tattoo verses. But when you, when you read this discourse and you see that Jesus is talking to the disciples, the reason he sent them to the lost sheep was because what we learn from this is they were equipped to speak to the lost sheep. When you're a saved follower of Christ, he equips you immediately to speak to the people first that you were closest to. He equips you immediately to speak to the people that you work with, that you play ball with, that you go to school with, people in your house. The reason he does that is because the people that know you best should first trust you, and second, they should notice a difference in you before anybody else does. They should notice a difference. So as the disciples went out and they spoke to the lost sheep, the lost sheep would see a difference in this message of the Messiah, the kingdom of God is at hand. They would see a difference in that. From here we see verses 9 and 10, if you're following your Bibles, chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, you can see where God's providing for the disciples. He says he's provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purse. He said, don't take anything for your trip. And this is relying on God's provision. It's what we can learn from this, relying on God's provision. God, God supplies us with opportunity and time. He supplies us with the things that we need to accomplish the work he calls us to. I heard a preacher say one time that God never made a chair. Y'all may have seen this before. He said, God never made a chair. He made a tree, and the rest was up to us. 
We can make the grandest chair beautiful with the skill that he gives us, with the opportunity he gives us, and the wood that he provides. But it's up to us. I run on the premise that for everybody, for most people, if they really wanted to, they would. And you can fill in this blank any way you want to. For most people, if they really wanted a better marriage, they would. For most people, if they really wanted to go back to school, they would. Now, granted, I said for most people. For most people, if they really wanted a stronger prayer life, they would. For most people, if they really wanted another Bible, they would. You see what I'm saying? Because it does require work on our part. If you lose a job you're, and you say, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on you to supply me the job I need perfect. The job I want. I'm going to sit right here in this chair and wait for my phone to ring. Chances are my cell phone is going to cut off before it rings because I still have to fill out applications. I still have to seek and knock and all that stuff. Y'all remember that Bible verse? But I still have to do my part. But again, God provides. And this brings us to the message we're going to talk about today. This is the next section. And it's all about the provision of God. But how is God going to supply for the disciples? In Matthew chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. If you would stand with me in honor of God's word. As I read just a few verses from the book of Matthew. Chapter 10, beginning at verse 11. Jesus continues teaching his disciples by saying... And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy. And there abide till ye go thence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust off your feet. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than the day of judgment than for that city. Y'all pray with me. Father, as we have come before you tonight, we thank you for how you have blessed us. Just the opportunity to be here. Father, I'm thankful for the feeling that I have in this church. Not a feeling of reminiscence, but a feeling of strength. Father, that you have continued to work and you continue to work in the lives of the people that inhabit this place. And Father, we praise you for that. And Lord, tonight I pray that you would strengthen us for the journey of head through the reading of your word. And let us not just have a place to understand it, but Lord, give us opportunity and encouragement to apply it. Lord, we praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. As you break this section of Scripture down and you look at the very first couple of verses, like 11 through 13, the beginning of 13, you can see this is still instruction to the apostles. And the point to stay with somebody worthy, the point to stay with somebody worthy, and the, somebody worthy, I'm going to tell you what somebody worthy was. Somebody who is worthy is somebody who is, has integrity. Somebody that has listened to the Word. Somebody who has absorbed the Word and really wants to learn more about it. So the disciples would inhabit this home and it would give them opportunity to invest in this individual. It would give them opportunity to hang out with them a little bit more and do like Jesus had done them and invested in them. The disciples learned tons on the way from point A to point B. If you like to journey... You learn a lot from point A to point B. If you're a book reader, you learn a lot more from a paper book than you do a digital book because you learn on your way there. The disciples were looking for somebody that was willing to listen, somebody that was worthy, which kind of brought me to a question, would my house be worthy? Would your house be worthy? What would make a worthy house? Jesus stayed at Nicodemus' house. You know, he went to tea there. You know, it's not scriptural, but anyway, it's the point. But he went to Zacchaeus' house. Did I say Nick Demas? It was Zacchaeus. Yeah, my bad. Zacchaeus going to a house for tea? Yeah, my bad. Zacchaeus. So when he went, to, when he went there, would, would my house be worthy? So that gives me something to strive for. So I've already learned one thing. But as Jesus, as Jesus instructs his disciples about going and looking 
for places to stay. He's like, you know, I'll supply it. But then it tells us what they were supposed to do if they didn't find what they were looking for. If they didn't find somebody that was worthy. If they didn't find somebody that was the exact same in their house as they were in public. We're full of that. What do they call those? Hypocrites. The <laughs> Bible says that word a lot. But see, that's the difference. He was looking for somebody that was exactly the same in their home as they were in public. And you know as well as I do, that's hard to find in any culture. So worthiness was difficult to find and in short supply. But Jesus told them if, you don't, if they're not worthy, you leave it. You take off out from it and you shake the dust off your clothes. And we could go through all the Old Testament application. But it was kind of a slight, kind of thumb and nose or whatever, that they shake the dust off their clothes. So in this section, what can we learn? I mean, really, for us today, what can we learn? Because most of us here are not going to stay with a stranger. Most of us here are probably not going to be shaking dirt off our clothes as we leave a building or somebody's house, though we might want to. We might want to cover ourselves in hand sanitizer or something, but we, we won't shake our dust off. So really, how can we apply... <coughs> I think I did. <clears throat> whatever that was. It won't be buzzing around me anymore, whatever that was. So what we're going to learn, <coughs> what, are, what we're going to learn from this is how Jesus taught his disciples to go in and seek out somebody worthy. We're going to learn our response, but more specifically, we're going to learn something. We're going to relieve some responsibility from us because we're not responsible for the response of the message. Okay? If that didn't confuse you enough, we're not responsible <coughs> for the response of the message, but we are responsible for our response of the response from the message. Are you confused yet? You won't be in just a second because this can be applied daily. To how we interact with people because as you look, yay! I hope when you look you say yay. Thank you, Dennis. But what you do is as you look, we're responsible for our response. And for a lot of people in the world that we live in today, so many people are afraid and they're really afraid of how they're taken. As, as you can probably already tell, I'm not really worried about what you think of me. Even though this is my home church, this is where I grew up, I'm not really concerned about what you think of me. Yes, I, I would like Cleet and Robin to think a lot of me. I would like Heather to think a lot of me. Even though me and Heather went to school together, I would still like her to think a lot of me. Dennis, the same way, I would like him to think a lot of me. Because in some way, we do think about what people think of us. But so many people are afraid of rejection. And they're paranoid of rejection so much so that they'll filter the things that they say and they'll adjust how they look, how they act, what they wear. All because they're afraid of being rejected. But see, a lot of this, when it comes to being a Christian and applying your Christian faith, a lot of people are so afraid of being rejected that it robs them of huge blessings going through life. <coughs> Because this in itself isn't even a logical thought to be worried about what somebody else thinks. Because think of all the times that you could care less what somebody thought. Football fans do this all the time. Diehard Alabama fans, diehard UT fans. All these people come into and they'll say, wow, they'll go to work on Monday morning and say, oh, I saw a huge play. You wouldn't believe it. This guy dove through the air and caught the ball and go through this big elaborate illustration could really care less about who listens to them. Doesn't care that they're telling it to somebody that's not a sports fan. Doesn't care if they're telling it to somebody whose teammate got that, who really liked the person that got run over during the process or something. Really doesn't make any difference. Why? Let's put this in a little different context. The reason that, the reason that a lot of people is they're afraid of the response. And there are usually three responses to about anything. Let's take case in point. If you go to a restaurant and you have a really good steak, and you go, if you're a steak fan, and you go, and you go to this restaurant, 
you're on a date with your wife, you go to this restaurant, and it's really good food, and on Monday morning, you go to work, you go to school, and you say, wow, I had the best steak I ever had in my life. Oh, so good. <clears throat> and you're telling this to somebody. One of three things is going to happen. First, the worst case scenario is somebody is going to say that they don't eat meat and they're like an animal activist or something and then you've just really waded off into it. Or they're going to say, well, I'm not really a steak eater. Or they could, the third response could be, yes, I like steak and I'd really like to know some more about this restaurant. Your response from that is usually dictated by what happens next your response to whatever they say. Because again, I'm not worried about your response. I'm not responsible for your response. Me preaching, I'm not responsible for your response at all. There's something else I'm responsible for. But the things that you can see that come out from such an interaction is how you respond first to the person that doesn't eat meat. You shake your dust off and pray for them. No, I'm kidding. You don't. I know some people that don't eat meat, and it's fine. But you, you just like, well, you make a note of that. They're, they're not steak eaters. The next person says, you know, I really don't like beef. It's like, but that's okay. The chicken looked really good. There, my wife actually got chicken. She's not a big steak eater either. But it was such a nice restaurant. The bathrooms were immaculate because you know that's the mark of a good restaurant. And everything was wonderful. You should still try it. <coughs> and the last thing is somebody that says, wow, that sounds really good. I'd like to hear some more about this restaurant. I'd like to know where it is. I'd like to know how you order. Which cut did you? Yeah, they want to know specifics. And in all three of these cases, you have an opportunity. All three of these cases, someone has an opportunity to share what they know, share their experience. Because in, at the end of it, that's what you're sharing is your experience. In all of those scenarios, you're sharing your experience. They can't call you a liar and tell you that the steak was no good because they didn't eat the steak. They had not had it. It wasn't their experience to share. It was yours. So why would you filter that? Why would you even worry? For us as Christians, the knowledge of Christ is what we share. In every shape, form, and fashion, we are responsible for the message. We're responsible for our response to the message. That's what you're responsible for. You're not responsible for somebody else's response. You're, res you're responsible to share it. You're responsible for what you have. You're responsible for obedience. You're responsible for what you do with the blessings that you have been given. The opportunities you've been given in hand. When When Christ saved your soul, you became responsible not just for a message, but for the message. The message that can literally not just change somebody's life, but save it. Not something that can make somebody live a little longer, but can make someone live for an eternity. You're responsible for that message. If you're a recipient of God's grace, if you're a recipient of His mercy, if you're a recipient of His love, you have become a recipient and your response is your obligation. How do you respond to it? What is your response to receiving those things? If you have the cure for cancer, if you come up with the cure for cancer, you're going to do one of three things with it. And this tells just huge volumes about your character and who you are because you're going to have three responses to having the cure for cancer. The first response is you will sell it. You just sell it off, make as much money as you can, you have the cure for cancer. The second response is you're going to bury it in the backyard and save it just in case you get cancer. And then the third response, you can share it. 
with anybody willing to take it. You can't make them take it, but anybody that's willing to take it, you can share it. So that tells you a lot about your heart, what you would do with something so amazing as the cure for cancer. Now what do we do with the gospel of Christ? What do we do with the gospel of Jesus? The gospel of, of God in the flesh coming down and taking my sin and your sin. Taking us just like we are, but loving us way too much to leave us how we are. The, what do we do with that? I mean, if I'm a recipient of something so huge as God's love and His mercy, His forgiveness, I'm responsible for something. I'm responsible to do something with it. But why would He dare give such a message like that to me? Why would, even, why would He bother giving a message like that to me? There are billions of people why would I be the one that gets this grace, this mercy? And the simple answer is because he loves me. Amen. I don't know why. One of the most beautiful verses in Scripture comes in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul says, But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. He placed this amazing treasure in me. If you, are, if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, if you are a saved follower of Christ, the same Holy Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and all the power associated with it. In this body in your body it's kind of odd but see we don't think about that because we're very visual, visual individuals a guy told me one time about they were cleaning out his grandma's basement and he, she had a cellar and she, was, she, she had passed away and when she had passed away there was all these mason jars in her cellar and they had been throwing away cases of these suckers all over the place. They were just like taking them out in droves and some of them were, they couldn't tell what they were and some of them they could but they wasn't dare going to open that thing. All these rusty mason jars and one fell that was wrapped in tinfoil had like a tinfoil liner, and it fell. And when it fell, it busted. And when it busted, everybody jumped back like they were fixing to get something nasty on them. And you know what fell out? Money. The, the, the mason jars that had tinfoil in them had money in them. She was a Depression-era child. She didn't trust banks. <clears throat> so she stashed her savings in ten full line mason jars. And they had thrown away cases. You hear that response? Every one of us in here gasp at the thought of money leaving and being thrown in a dumpster. Every one of us gasp at the single thought of a dollar bill getting thrown into a dumpster. How many people inhabit that graveyard whose souls went to hell because somebody was more concerned about a dollar bill than sharing the treasure within them? They were more concerned about what somebody else thought of them. The gasp of all that money getting thrown away. The idea of all that. We live in a world today where so many people invest in their self and they gauge themselves like, what would I do if I won the lottery? I would give all this money to this. I would give all this money to this. What about giving yourself to your neighbor? What about giving the gospel of Christ to somebody that needs it? What about investing in your kids to know that they will be in heaven with you? You can't take anything from this world. If you've heard that, you go to heaven the same way you got in here, you know, naked with nothing kind of thing. When you get to heaven, you can have one thing. You can have your children. That should be enough to drive us to share the gospel. That should be enough to drive us to read our Bible. That should be enough to get us to do a little bit more. But does it? 
Have we become so callous to the things of God that we just think that... What do we think? You are not responsible for somebody else's response to the message. But you are also responsible for your response to their response. Over in Acts chapter 26, I'm only going to turn there for a second. It's one of my favorite things that Paul ever did. In Paul in Acts chapter 26, you see where Paul is standing before Agrippa, and if you read the context and all of Paul ingenious worlds of study that he had acquired from the feet of Gamaliel, he chooses to share the gospel of Christ in its simplicity. And as he's speaking, he's talking to Agrippa, an educated man, and at the end of it, in verse 24, something happens. As Paul is in mid-sentence, this happens. Verse 24 of Acts chapter 26 says, And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice. Paul got interrupted. This jerk interrupts Paul. Festus. And he says this, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doeth make thee mad. You've studied so much you have become crazy. That's what it renders down. But he said, Paul said this. This was Paul's response to a jerk. They had rejected the message of Christ with a single, what we have, a single verse of Scripture, dismissing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I am not mad, most notable Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. For the king knoweth these things before whom I also speak freely. He didn't answer him angry. He didn't tell him to shut up. He didn't tell him to go away. He didn't tell him anything. He was nice to Festus. Most notable Festus. When was the last time you had a humble response to somebody that called you a name? When was the last time that you treated somebody kindly that had just treated you like a jerk? See, our response to the world around us is very important. Our response to the world around us shows Christ more than you can ever know, more than you can ever realize. When you don't let the things of this world get under your skin and take control, that is the message of Christ. That gives you opportunity not to share endless amounts of Scripture and how much you know about your Bible, but something far more important. <gasps> I just said more important than that. Do you know what the most powerful tool you have on this earth to win people to Christ, to fill heaven and to empty hell is your testimony. Amen. What God has done in your life, what he's doing in your life, and the expectation of what you have him to do next. See, that can't be refuted. That can't be argued. Because it's your experience. It's not mine. It's yours. That's the most powerful tool that you have. If it is rejected, so be it. You're not responsible for the response responsible for the message by accepting the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeking forgiveness from sin from him recognizing his shed blood on the cross has made you a way through faith to enter into the kingdom of God that testimony the understanding that revelation that's powerful 
Why is it the last thing that we share? We tend to overdo things in America. I know guys that take a 30 out 6 squirrel hunting. A little bit of an overkill. <laughs> Does everybody that you know of know your testimony? <coughs> they know that you seek, that you pray, maybe that you pray for them. What do they know of you and your relationship with Christ? You are not responsible for somebody else's response. You are responsible for your response. What's your response? Today, tonight, what is your response to the gospel of Christ? Are you willing to wave off any thought of somebody rejecting? Because really, if somebody rejects the gospel and re tries to reject your testimony, they're not rejecting you. Jesus said they hated me way before they hated you. Are you willing to make a step and be responsible for your own response? Because I believe if you're responsible for your own response, you won't worry about somebody else's. You won't worry if you say the right things. If you continue reading in Matthew, Jesus even tells the disciples, don't sweat it when they arrest you. You'll know what to say. Are you willing to respond? Whether you're saved, whether you're in quote-unquote good standing with God, what is your conviction? Every one of us take a multitude of steps every day. What is your next step in Christ? I'm asking you to make one tonight. You can, not tomorrow. Not in the morning. Not when you get back to school. Not... not Tonight. Resolve within yourself to make that step. Whatever it is. Cleet's going to come up and have her invitation hymn come. And if you'd like somebody to pray with you about this, I'd love to pray with you about wherever you're at, wherever God is leading you, whatever is getting in your way of making a step. I want to pray for you about that. And I know Dennis would love to as well. Whatever is in your way, together we'll pray to get rid of that, to move it. God, faith can move mountains. Amen. Sometimes God gives you a shovel. <laughs> but you still got to pick it up. Wherever you're at today, leave here stronger with a purpose. Resolve within yourself to do something, to respond. And God will equip you to respond to the world that you run into. He'll not forsake us. He will not leave us. He provided for us from the beginning and He will continue to do so. What's your response?